lovely Maple Grove, Minnesota, and SixFootMama.com. This is Still Growing with Jennifer Ebling. Still Growing is a gardening podcast dedicated to helping you and your garden grow. Hi there, everyone, and welcome to Still Growing, and thank you for listening. I'm your host, Jennifer Ebling. Well, do you have all of your Christmas decorations put away by now? If you do, you're ahead of me. It is the 6th of January, and we haven't even started putting away our Christmas decorations. I've got to get the tree down and then go through the house and find all of the little things that I've tucked here and there to add Christmas cheer to the house, and it's time to take it down. But we just haven't had a chance. Emma started the speech team, so my 15-year-old daughter is doing that. And then all three boys, my 17, 13, and 11-year-olds, are all in basketball. So every single weekend now, between now and March, we have a basketball tournament or a speech tournament or both or multiple basketball tournaments. So (laughs) pick your poison. But anyway, I was thinking this morning, why is this not getting done? And it's because in the past, I used to have an entire day or an eight-hour block of time to attend to these things. And my life is kind of back into that mode where I can grab an hour here maybe or two hours there, but those long days of being able to get everything done in a single day, those days are gone right now. So we're doing things in small increments here. We're going to get started on Christmas cheer takedown. And I'm also sprucing up the office just a little bit. The office in the house is where I record for the show and I do all of the work in preparation for new episodes here. And I decided it needed a little bit of sprucing up. So I got these new whiteboards where I can see the production calendar. And I'll take a picture and and put it on the Facebook group. But um, And I've just also decided to try to beautify the space a little bit. And I was so excited. I think it was right after Thanksgiving, our pottery barn in town had this huge clearance sale. I didn't even know they did this. But they had all of the pottery barns in the Twin Cities send up all of their items that were on clearance. And they had a warehouse sale. And when I was in there, there was a gorgeous gorgeous curio cabinet. It was a black metal curio cabinet. It has a lot of mirrors inside of it and then a lot of glass. So it's very, um, how shall I say, It feel, it's very striking looking. Anyway, I was mesmerized by this thing. And the first day I went, I saw it and I thought, "Uh, you know, where am I going to put this? I'm going to wait. I'll I'll come back tomorrow. If it's still here, I'll, I'll maybe think about it. Well, I came back the next day and this $300 curio cabinet is marked down to like, I don't know, 125 or something. And there was an hour left of the sale. And I went up to the guy and I'm like, hey, would you consider, you know, going down a little bit on the price here? And he's like, how about 75? I was totally blown away. I did not expect him to say that. And I'm like, sold. So I get this thing home. And the best idea came to me. And it was to turn this desktop curio stand into a little terrarium greenhouse kind of thing. So it's got a shelf and it's got a mirrored back and then a lot of glass all around it. And it is now the place where I store all of my begonias that I'm collecting and I have it here in the office. So as I'm recording and working during the day, I can see my favorite begonia collection right inside that curio cabinet and it makes me so happy. And I can also attend to them a little bit better because when I had them on the windowsill in the dining room, I kind of would forget about them and they were languishing a little bit. So now they're just gorgeous. The leaves are full and hydrated and everybody's happy and they've got their little space that they can call their own. And it makes my office really look beautiful. So I love, love, love that. Well, I suppose we better get about the business of welcome welcoming new members to our listener community that's on Facebook. And this week, I want to welcome Paula Goldman Don, Marilee Karwaski, Alan Warren, Linda Richardson, Jessica Fell, 
Kim Rathwell, Jean Ann Foster, and Don Pape. Don Pape, of course, was on episode 536 of the show. Don wrote The Lawn Chair Gardener's Guide to Gardening, and she also does this magnificent work in the area of getting kids into gardening and into conservation. Dawn is passionate about water quality and saving monarchs and pollinators and our bees, of course. She wrote that lovely book, Mason Meets a Mason Bee, and she does a puppet show. So anyway, the Facebook group is our listener community And it's a place that I've created online for listeners of the show and guests of the show to come together, share their garden stories, share information, ask questions, and I absolutely love it. So I would love to invite you to join the group. If it's something you're interested in, all you have to do is go to Facebook and then type in the words Still Growing Podcast Group, and then our group should pop right up. Now, it's going to look like it's a closed group because it is a private group. So the things that you share in that group or that I share in that group are private. It's just for the group. But if you ask to join, I'll make sure that you're a real person and then I'll admit you into the group and then you can be part of the group. The group is also where I go to find winners for our giveaways. So last week we gave away five copies of Robin Pear's plant book dedicated to hardy geraniums. It's that wonderful book called The Plant Lover's Guide to Hardy Geraniums in the Plant Lover's Guide series by Timber Press. It's a fantastic book and Robin was so generous. She gave away five copies. So that was just a wonderful giveaway. And of course, we went to the group when it was time to pick winners. The Facebook group is also where I curate content for you in between episodes. So it's a way to stay in touch and also continue to give you new content throughout the week. This week, I've stumbled on some really fun items that I've shared in the group, and I want to give you a little sampling of some of the things that are making it into the Facebook group this past week. The first thing I'm very excited about, I'm going to keep my eye on it and definitely go get one for my Myself, if and when it becomes available here at one of our local stores. But Lancome is highlighting a new product that's coming out in their spring collection. So it's not available yet, but it is coming out shortly. And it's highlighting powder and it's in the shape of a rose. It's absolutely gorgeous. And they shared a picture of it in a release on January 4th of this year. It honestly looks so beautiful, this rose that's in a compact that I don't think I could bring myself to actually use it, but it's just something else. So I want it. I want to have one and I want to be able to show my friends that are gardeners because they will just flip. I might actually have to buy a few for some of my friends, but it's just absolutely gorgeous. So if you're looking for a gift or you have a gardener that has a birthday coming up right about now, I'm telling you this, this compact is going to be amazing. So I don't see a name for it other than to call it Spring Highlighting Powder. So if you Google that, Lancome is the maker and it's their highlighting powder. It looks like an actual rose. It really blows you away. Okay, let's see. The other thing that I shared would be the landscape design principles for residential gardens. These were eight rules for creating a satisfying garden that's neither uh, fussy or constraining. And this was shared by Garden Design Magazine. They sent out this article in their newsletter And what caught my attention is they said it was their most popular article in 2016. So out of all of the great content that Garden Design Magazine had put together, this was the real highlight, the real winner for them last year. What I loved about the article when I started looking at it is it really does share some very smart 
basic essential building block design principles for gardeners. So if design is something that you struggle with, and I think most people do struggle with design from time to time, we have these areas where we just don't know what to do with them in the garden. This article might really be a benefit to you. It goes through a number of different design rules and principles. The law of significant enclosure, which talks about how a garden is actually an enclosed space, following the regulating line, following uh, the rule of the golden rectangle to get proportions right. There's a lot of great concepts in here that I think are very beneficial and are, you know, kind of constants for garden design folks. So give that uh, article a look at. It's I think it'll be very helpful to you. The next article that caught my eye, and actually I wanted to share it last week, but we kind of ran out of time, is there was a fun article that was called Six Ways to Give Your Home a Cotswold Makeover. And this was featured way back in December, in the middle of December, and it's by Emma Louise Pritchard. Now, the Cotswolds is famous for its classic and rustic country feel. Now, Cotswolds' design is steeped in history. One of the things that caught my eye when I was first looking at this was this image of a beautiful boot room with a modern welly rack. So it had this fantastic storage area for boots and boot storage. They did such a great job of this. So if you're putting together a mudroom or maybe an area for your wellies for the garden, this would be full of ideas for you how to do it in a very stylish designed manner, taking some of the best ideas from Cotswold Design. Well, another post that had made it into Garden Design Magazine's newsletter last week was a creation from DivineEscapes.com. Now, this is a stonemason that puts together all kinds of stonework. And one of the things that he started doing was creating these dry stone sphere garden sculptures. And Garden Design Magazine had said, hey, anytime we share this image of this garden sphere, people go crazy. And I looked into this guy that designs it, and he does a lot of really neat things, cool things to put these spheres together. So if you have a stone worker that has done some work on your property, you might want to take a look at this article and see how these spheres get put together together because I think it's very doable for people who are in the trade. So if you have an artist or someone who's done stonework on your property and you're looking to add maybe something sculptural or something artistic this year and you're not sure what you want to do, I don't think you can go wrong with a sphere. One of the nice touches that this guy does is he uh, creates a little poem or a song and he'll put that in in the bottom of the sphere, in the base of the sphere, and then he builds the sphere around this little note that has his poem or or prayer or song lyrics, whatever it is, he'll put that in there. And I thought it was really uh, kind of a nice little touch. Anyway, the article is fantastic. It's very inspirational. There's also a video that shows how he puts the spheres together in the garden. And then I don't know how he does this, but he actually, when this particular sphere was completed, he actually needed to move it over a couple of feet. And if you can imagine, he's just stacking all of this stone and the sphere looks to be about four feet high. So it'd be very, very heavy and about four feet wide. So I don't know how he moved it and there's absolutely no glue holding it together. It's all just stacked that way, and it makes this beautiful sphere. So I think this sphere idea is very doable. If you've got a stonemason or someone who's done stonework on your property, you could show this to them and see if they could put something like that together for you in your garden. Well, there was a post that was shared on Flipboard this week, and it was by Autumn757 at WordPress.com. And I had to stop and just take it in, take in all of the imagery, because this writer was featuring Egyptian walking onions, which is one of my favorite perennials in my garden. And she did such a wonderful job of taking pictures of these Egyptian walking onion. And when I shared it in the Facebook group, I said, oh, I have about 110 days left to go 
before I'm going to see my Egyptian walking onion again. They need such little care. They're so beautiful. They're It's kind of fun to see where they pop up in the garden. And then, of course, if you don't like them, they're easy to take out. So there's just so many wonderful things about Egyptian walking onions. So if you're a lover of that plant as well, you'll want to see that post. She did a great job. Well, Gardenista shared a post this week in their Gardening 101 segment, and it's all about mosh. And mosh, they refer to as the new arugula, but mosh is so easy to grow, and it's got so many wonderful health benefits that if you're someone who's looking for something to grow in your cold frame this winter, or if you're looking at maybe starting something indoors, mosh is a great option. But this article by Gardenista was really nice because I think of it as kind of an intro to mosh. If you aren't familiar with it, this would be a great article to read. It was published on January 5th. It's by Laura Boyle, and I thought it was very well done. Well, there was a very cute piece that was published in the Washington Post this past week, and it featured a nine-year-old who had grown a cabbage this summer, and his grandparents actually helped him care for this cabbage. And the picture that is run in the Washington Post shows this nine-year-old posing by his cabbage, and get this, it's 30 pounds. It's a 30-pound cabbage cabbage. And it won the National Bonnie Plants Cabbage Program's Virginia competition. No doubt. I'm sure it did. So this nine-year-old who had never grown a cabbage before has a tip. And his tip is find a pot. Between March and August, this little guy shepherded a cabbage from transplant to a monster 30-pound green cannonball by growing it in a 20-inch container. And the article talks about how his grandparents, who are gardeners, Marie and Jerry Cornett, in the town of Damascus in southwest Virginia, really helped coal nurture and take care of this plant. He Cole lives right across the road with his parents, Amy and Jay Kaywood. And when he got the cabbage as part of the National Bonnie Plants Cabbage Program, he knew instantly that this plant would probably do better at his grandparents who are veteran veggie growers. So the article states that this was his first good move. Well, then his second move was to put it in a pot. And even the writer of this piece says this seems counterintuitive because a cabbage likes deep soil and even moisture, especially in the heat and humidity of Southern Virginia. But the container turned out to be the perfect environment for the cabbage, and the cabbage is a vigorous hybrid named O.S. Cross. So the container was critical because when it was freezing in the early spring, the cabbage was brought in from the back patio to spend the night in the kitchen. Then when summer storms threatened, the cabbage came back inside the house so that its leaves would not be ripped by rain or wind. And then every day after school, coal watered the cabbage. And as the season grew warmer and the cabbage grew bigger, he would water it twice a day. He thought he might encounter cabbage worm, but it never happened. Every 15 days, he fertilized it with supervision from his grandmother, and she told him to mix a tablespoon with a gallon of water, and he dutifully kept a record of everything he did to care for this cabbage all of the days that he took care of it. And by the end of the experiment, he had managed to raise a cabbage whose size his family had never seen before. Even his experienced grandmother and grandfather had never seen a cabbage that big. And one of the cutest things that's mentioned in the article, and I caught it right away, is that Cole is the name of this nine-year-old. And Cole is, of course, the name that gardeners give to the members of the cabbage family. That's where we get the term coleslaw. And of course, he's perfectly named to grow a cabbage. So there's an adorable picture of Cole with this 30-pound cabbage, which completely overpowers him. You get a real sense of the scale when you see this picture. This little guy is sitting on the grass, and his cabbage is in front of him, and he's partially hidden. That's how big this cabbage is. So you've got to check that out. That was really, really wonderful. 
There were three articles related to trees that went in the Facebook group this week. The first is all about tree canopies. MIT is working to map the tree canopies of the world's biggest cities. And at 19.5%, Toronto came in fourth ahead of Paris, London, and New York, but trailing Vancouver, Geneva, and Seattle for tree canopy. That was a very interesting article. Another article about trees has to do with German forester Peter Wallenben. Yale University did a fascinating interview with him. And of course, Peter is the author of the really fascinating book, The Hidden Life of Trees. Peter says that trees are social beings with friends and personalities, and he backs it all up with science. And his book, The Hidden Life of Trees, should definitely be on your library bookshelf if it isn't already. Well, Peter, of course, is German. And as long as I was looking through German websites about trees, I stumbled on this great article by DW. It's a German website. And they shared the landscapes, plants, and fungi of 2017. Some of the highlights from this article include the tree of the year, which is spruce. It's a highly controversial tree, which dominates about a quarter of Germany's forests. And they say in the article that the growing of spruce means maximal wood production in a monocultural setting. Not many other plants or animals have much of a chance here. They said it was a brave choice of the jury to choose this tree, and the idea was to trigger a debate about its future. The mushroom of the year in Germany loves deciduous forests. It's called the Jew's ear, wood ear, or jelly ears, and it's named for its shape. It grows mostly on the trunks of old elder trees, but it also likes maple or beech. It's related to a tasty Chinese mushroom known as the cloud ear fungus, and there's a great picture of it in this post. Well, there is a gorgeous moss, a special moss that has a very big Latin name that I'm not even going to try to pronounce, but they show how it anchors itself in limestone rock, even in the steepest places. And this post is absolutely beautiful. The picture that they show, the plant can survive with barely any room for its roots and very few nutrients. And that's why the Central European moss and lichen experts chose it as the moss of 2017. There are a number of highlights in this report, but the last one I thought was really interesting has to do with the poppy. So the Loki Schmidt Foundation, she's the wife of former German Chancellor Helmut Schmidt, chose the poppy as the flower of the year for Germany. The plant stands for biological diversity in agriculture, and it's a symbol for the war dead, of course. On a previous episode at the end of one of the shows, one of the things that you may have come across if you're a regular listener of the show, is my son PJ reciting the poem Flanders Fields. And of course, the poem talks about the poppies growing on the field. Poppies also represent a large community of plants and animals that have been with us for thousands of years and are now endangered by large monoculture fields. So this article, when you get to it, when you when you actually click over to it, I'll warn you, is a slideshow. So I, I always hate when they don't have it just kind of all right there and you have to click through to get to it. But this one is very worth it. They do a w- wonderful job of showing beautiful images providing good information, and then highlighting the landscapes, plants, and fungi of the year for 2017 in Europe. Well, there are, of course, a number of recipes that made it into the group this week, and a few of them include this amazing cookie recipe by Dory Greenspan. She knows this recipe by heart because it only has three ingredients, and they're called almond crackle cookies. And when you watch Dory in this video talking about how she makes these almond crackle cookies, you are going to be so motivated. You are going to run into your kitchen, grab that bag of sliced almonds and make those cookies. That's how fantastic this video is. There's a great recipe for dry fried green beans a chive omelet, and I guarantee you've never seen a chive omelet like this. And then, of course, a roasted chicken and vegetable recipe. 
which the boys are going to help me make next Friday night. That's kind of the roundup of some of the top posts that made it into the Facebook group this week. You don't need to take notes. All you have to do is click to join. Just go to Facebook, ask to join the Still Growing Podcast group, and I'll let you in the group. Another great way that you can get to the group quickly is to go to my website, sixfootmama.com. That's the number six, F-T-M-A-M-A.com. And I have a link to the Facebook group right in the menu. So just click on that. It'll take you to the group and then just request to join. And all of these curated articles will pop right up. Well, it was a happy day for me, the day that I got to interview today's guest, Peggy Ann Montgomery of American Beauty Native Plants. And I was thrilled when I went to call her. She still has a Minnesota area code on her cell phone number. She's a Minnesota girl. She grew up in White Bear Lake. She's a lover of nature. She lived in Minnesota until she was 16. And then she started to travel the world. She went to the West Coast. She lived in Germany and Holland. And now she lives in Delaware. But she's still got that Minnesota area code. Peggy Ann has a fascinating personal history that led her to the northern part of Holland after college to a province called Friesland, where she went to school for horticulture. And she not only understands Frisian, but she can speak Dutch. She's got four great kids and six grandkids now, the light of her life. And Holland is still very much like a home to her and very fun for her to go back. Which, since she's my friend on Facebook now, I get to see all of her beautiful pictures of Holland anytime she does go back. Which, of course, would make my great-grandparents so happy because they were from Holland as well. And we have a lot of family photos of Holland. You know, Peggy Ann has been working in horticulture for nearly 30 years already. She has a background in native plant research, public relations, and sales. She's owned her own business as a landscape designer in the Netherlands, if you can believe that. She's a garden writer. She spent 10 years at Bailey Nurseries here in town in the Twin Cities. And then she got a job for two years doing native plant research at the Mount Cuba Center in Delaware. And the Mount Cuba Center, of course, is dedicated to the native plants of the Piedmont. So that is the career move that ultimately led her to her current job in native plants. She was inspired by that experience at Mount Cuba, and she wrote to American Beauty Native Plants and sort of created her own job. Now, the American Beauty story is very inspiring because they were created to get more balance back into our ecosystems and, of course, to keep our food web going. Now, how American Beauty Native Plants works is not the nurseries. They license growers. In fact, they have growers all around the country, and the growers are are growing a palette of plants that is native to their area. And what I love best about their approach is that all of the plants, all of the native plants, have to meet a set of criteria to ensure their success for gardeners. Now, Peggy Ann is the sole employee of American Beauty Native Plants. And in today's show, you get the chance to hear her presentation that she delivered at the Garden Bloggers Fling on Saturday night. And it was all about incorporating native plants into your garden. We talk a little bit about a passion project for American Beauty Native Plants, which is wildlife way stations. Wildlife way stations provide food for wildlife, provide a clean source of water, and provide cover for wildlife and a place to raise their young. So that term, wildlife way stations, will come up in the interview. And if it's something you haven't heard before, Peggy Ann and American Beauty Native Plants is really leading the charge on this. She's very passionate about helping you bring life to your garden. And then finally, the giveaway is a book that's very special to Peggy Ann, and it's called Bringing Nature Home by Doug Tallamy. It's a wonderful extension of their whole commitment to wildlife and native plants. And I hope after this interview, you catch some of the fire and the passion that Peggy Ann brings to the table as she talks about native plants. Well, hi there, Peggy Ann. Hello there, Jennifer. It's so nice of you to have me. Well, I was so excited to get a chance to interview you. We got to meet at the Garden Bloggers Fling in Minneapolis this summer, 
And you gave, as we were talking in the pre-chat here, a lovely presentation on native plants that I was totally captivated by, and that's going to be our main focus today. But before we get into that, why don't we have you share a little bit about yourself, your career in horticulture, which is so amazing, and don't forget the good parts of your time in Minnesota working with Bailey, because you're from White Bear Lake, aren't you? I am. I am a true Minnesotan. I love Minnesota, and I think White Bear Lake is the most wonderful place in the world to have grown up in, um, I, and I still miss it all the time. You know, I lived not far from the lake, and, and I saw bald eagles every day, and I could hear the loons on the oh. water. That's pretty great. Not, not too many people get to hear that every day. That's right. Well, let's start with horticulture. You know, my mom and my grandpa were really good gardeners, and so I think I got an interest really early on, and um, I think I even won a little garden contest when I was like 10 or something. But um, when I went to school, I went to the University of Minnesota. I studied, originally studied early childhood development and nutrition, which, you know, back that many years ago, (laughs) people, uh, you know, weren't as up to date on on how food and, and, and caffeine and sugars and things were affecting children's behavior. But kind of on a, on, on a fluke, I went to Germany for a year as an au pair and then made my way up to the Netherlands. And so first, of course, I had to go to Dutch school <laughs> to speak <laughs> Dutch because that's easy. And then actually I was able to go back to university and study again. And so I took up horticulture. I mean, that's just like one of the best places in the world to learn, I think. And wow. So I studied an apprentice there for four years before beginning my landscape design business there, which I had for another 10 years. Hmm. After that, you know, sadly, uh, I had gotten divorced and my mother in Minnesota was very ill. She was dying. And so I moved back to Minnesota just to help my sisters take care of her and keep her at home as long as we could. And so I kind of asked around, you know, like, where's the best place to work in horticulture? And everybody said, Bailey Nurseries, and Bailey's is a big wholesaler headquartered in Minneapolis, and lucky for me, they hired me, and I spent 10 years there working in sales and in marketing. You know, we did like the big endless summer hydrangea rollout, all kinds of things like that, and I'm still really close to the Bailey family. They mean a great deal to me, but eventually, I was kind of looking for a, a new adventure. I wanted to learn more about native plants. And I was fortunate enough to get a job at the Mount Cuba Center in Delaware. And the Mount Cuba Center is all dedicated to native plants of the Piedmont. And so I went to work for them for two years doing native plant research. And it was marvelous. I learned so much. It was absolutely tremendous. And then with that under my belt, I, you know, I felt really confident. And I wrote to the good folks at American Beauty's Native Plants and sort of created a job and, and told them what I thought I could do for them. And uh, again, lucky for me, they hired me. Wow. <laughs> so I know I've been with them for a few years now. And, you know, they say, you know, if you love what you do, you never work a day in your life. That's exactly right. American Beauties um, is a brand of native plants that was created about 10 years ago. It's co-owned by Steve Castriani from North Creek Nurseries and Mark Salou from Pride's Corner Farms. And these guys have other very big, busy businesses to take care of. But they created this because they really believe that we need to get some more balance back in our ecosystems and that we all, um, you know, need to have more native plants to keep our food web going. Um, And so what we do is we license growers in different parts of the country. We have six growers all over the United States. And we develop um, a palette of plants that's native to their area, but they also need to meet some other criteria. They need to be good landscape plants, and they can't be things that uh, run or become invasive or uh, or anything like that. And then we help them with the branding and marketing and public relations. We do tons and tons of research for the plant tags and um, take care of the website and all of that. And... Um, since I'm the only one that works there, I, I wear a lot of hats. <laughs> yes, you do. 
So when you're working with American Beauties, can people buy directly from American Beauty or do they sell only to nurseries? We sell, our growers sell to nurseries. But what you can do is you go um, to our website at abnativeplants.com and right up in the top uh, right-hand corner, you can put in your zip code and it'll tell you which garden centers in your area carry American Beauty's native plants. Oh, that's handy. Yeah. You're on the show today because of this fantastic presentation that you gave during the reception on Saturday night of the Garden Bloggers Fling. And before we get going, I just have to say, I loved your presentation. So as you're sitting there talking, I'm going, I just have got to get her on the show. I want her to do that presentation. I loved it. Oh, my gosh. Oh, thank you. That was really sweet. I, you know, that was my first garden bloggers and, uh, you know, I really, really enjoyed it. I would never have believed, you know, walking in, not knowing anybody that I would walk away with so many interesting people I want to be friends with. It was great. Yeah. Well, and me too. It was my first time there too. And I just was like, oh my gosh. And then I was actually in a tour in Maple Grove. So I couldn't participate on Sunday because I had to go up to my own tour. And so Saturday night was really my last, you know, time with the group and your presentation to me, it was like kind of the capstone. And I'm wondering if you can just introduce the presentation and maybe offer a comment or two on your thoughts on growing native plants. I guess what I want people to know is, you know, we're not trying to say it's native or nothing. We're just trying to tell folks, you know, about the great qualities of native plants and how much life that they can bring into your garden. And I think a lot of people just don't know, um, you know, about the habitat decline and, and how little protected land there is in the United States and why that's so important. Um, the other thing I wish people would, you know, learn is that um, native plants and insects and the rest of the food web have evolved together over millennia. And so there's some very special relationships between plants and animals. If we um, talk about a host plant, uh, a real common one would be um, butterfly weed. And that's the only plant that monarch larvae can eat. So, you know, without those, there wouldn't be any monarchs. And the other thing, too, is, you know, I just would like to encourage people to put down the chemicals. We really need insects. We need insects to feed the birds. I mean, it's amazing, but just like one next of chickadees, um, the parents have to feed between, gosh, I think it's like five and 7,000 caterpillars just to raise one nest. Think about that. You know, baby birds can't eat bird feed. Um, they need to eat insects, and caterpillars are preferred because they're soft-bodied and it won't tear their you know, their little tiny necks. Um, so think about that. It, you know, I think about how many nests are in our yard. Um, I just realized we are rich. We must have millions and millions of insects. Hmm. <laughs> you know, it's interesting to hear you talk about the connections between the plants and the entire food system or the food chain that's involved with them. One time I had posted about putting down chemicals or stop using uh, sprays on your plants. And a listener had said, well, aren't you talking about pesticides? And I said, no, I'm, I mean, herbicides are killing insects too. Um, people don't always appreciate that. You know, that's right. You know, and I would just, um, I would really advocate for, for not using any chemicals at all. Um, you know, even lawn fertilizer, um, you know, can, um, you know, can run off and get into the um, septic systems and stuff. And that's a really big polluter. You know, I guess I'd rather have some leaves that were chewed on than to have my grandkids playing grass that has chemicals on it. Yeah. Yeah. I just uh, had Dawn Pape on the show. And that's one of the things that we talked about as well is that it's a, always a symbiotic relationship. So you have the pests that you don't want, but in a way, when you've got those, 
they kind of act as a beacon to their predators. And so if you're if you're suffering with an infestation, oftentimes that's that's like calling their predators to come into your space and take care of it. You can really disrupt the balance of things when you are trying to get a quick fix through chemical you use. Are yeah, I'm sorry to talk over you, but you are absolutely right. That, that's really key, and, and I think you'll find if there is a little bit of an infestation this year, it won't be there next year. Mother Nature has been able to take care of herself uh, long before we came along, and um, she'll continue to do so. <laughs> That's exactly right. Well, about 20 years ago, there was an article by Tony Avent that was published called Cutting Through the Jungle, Native Plant Myths and Realities. And it began like this. In a 1994 New York Times article, Michael Pollan called them eco-Nazis. Radio talk show host Rush Limbaugh calls them environmental wackos. Whatever you call them, the American native plant movement in this country is gaining momentum and picking up supporters from every walk of life. In terms of attitudes, so here we are uh, heading into 2017. A lot has changed with regard to how people perceive native plants. Oh, you're, t- you're absolutely right. We've come an awful long way uh, since Tony wrote that article. Um, you know, there's been a lot of research done since then, and um, people have become more aware of the important benefits that nature gives to us, all of nature, plants and animals. I think that we are really finally getting the wind in our sails uh, about native plants and that people are beginning to take notice. It was kind of fun. A few years ago, Better Homes and Gardens asked me to do like a roundup of plant awards from all over the country. And while I was doing that task, it dawned on me that these plant awards are filled with native plants in their cultivars. Hmm. I mean, it makes sense when you think about it. Absolutely. So I kind of like to say, well, yeah, don't take my word for it. Look at the award. Oh, that's great. And that was in Better Homes and Gardens. Yeah, it was a few years ago. Um, but, you know, it, it's it's just amazing. I, I think people mistake native for being something that's wild or unattractive and All the plants we include in our palette are plants that are landscape-worthy. We want people to be successful. And, um, you know, I I, I think that's changing. You know, I think education is changing, too, and I think that's huge. I think when most of us studied here or abroad, um, we weren't taught the importance of native plants. And... So I think that's been part of the problem is that people at garden centers, working at garden centers, they may not know what's native either. And that's that's what the band was put together was to just help consumers identify what's native because studies bear out that they're looking for them. They just can't find them. And, you know, I know that, um, you know, I work with a lot of schools, middle schools and things like that. And, you know, the great teachers now, you know, especially in Minnesota, I know for sure, are really teaching kids about ecology and biodiversity. So I think our next generation is going to be um, better educated and even more excited about native plants than we are now. I love that. And it's the perfect lead up to the next question. And it's something that you addressed right away in the presentation. It was, I think, one of the first couple of slides. And that was how you define native plants. And by the way, I love that you're including the term landscape worthy and that you're kind of filtering native plants through that because that overcomes a lot of attitudinal barriers right there. I agree with you. And I think that that really is key. All the plants that are in uh, any of our assortments anywhere in the country have been tested, um, you know, and um, we take that very seriously. Um, You know, I think it's kind of funny as an industry, we're not able to put out one definition of what's native. It means different (laughs) things to different people. So our definition is, um, I'll just read it, Uh, we define natives as straight species and their cultivars with cultivars being selections of straight species that have not been hybridized with other species. So does that make sense to anybody? Nope. (laughs) (laughs) Just going to say, I think everybody's just like, wah, wah. (laughs) 
I know, right? We, gosh, we make it so hard for consumers sometimes in our business. All that means is, yeah, the native plant, the straight species, and a lot of times in nature, plants will mutate in some ways. The flower might be a little bit different, or it will be more compact, or it will be taller, uh, or the flower will be larger. And so naturally occurring cultivars like those, um, we would include um, in our definition. Um, and we're finding out there's a lot of research being right, done right now about cultivars of native plants. And um, I think we're going to find that in general, um, the cultivars work as well as the, as the street species in general. We'll have to look at that plant by plant. So I'm going to give you an example that I think probably most people know. It's Annabelle hydrangea. And this is a really great plant. It's tough. It grows everywhere. It grows in Minnesota. It grows here. And Annabelle is a naturally occurring cultivar. It was um, discovered in the wild near Anna, Illinois. And that's how some great new native plants come along. So with that hydrangea then, people can plant it anywhere and it's native? Or does it need to be in, you know, the Midwest to be native? Well, every um, every plant has a range. Some have a huge range in, in like all, you know, all 48 states. Some have a smaller range. Um, you can, when you go to our, again, at our um, website, avnativeplants.com, if you look at a plant, you know, you click on its page, it will show you um, a picture of the states, the United States, um, and it'll be colored in where that plant is native. Okay, that's that's a great tip. I love that. Uh, so it's kind of an interactive map that way. You can put in the, put in the plant you're interested in and then see exactly where uh, home is, right? Right, exactly. Because obviously, you know, what my grower in Arizona is putting out is a whole lot different than my grower in Connecticut. Ah, okay. So is there a divide, do you think, right now between Team Native and what I called Team Exotic? I was trying to think of the polar opposite to Team Native, so I, that's, the, that's the term I came up with. So uh, number one, do you think there is a divide? And number two, did I get the opposite term correct? Do you think there should be, is it, it, would it be Team Native would that, or Team Exotic? Would that be the opposite of Team Native? Well, if there is a divide, I think it's too bad, and I don't think that there should be one, as long as exotic doesn't mean invasive. Mm. I know that there are places, organizations like Wild Ones, who do great work, and they only use straight species. In fact, they often do restoration work, where they'll use um, like local ecotypes, things that have been grown right in that area, and I applaud them for that. Um, but our definition is a little broader because we want to be more inclusive. We would absolutely never say, um, you know, you know, only natives. Take okay. everything out. Start. That's crazy. We just are saying the next time you're going to add some things, why not think about adding a native? Yes. Um, and I think, you know, once people under, kind of understand the reason for it, they get more excited about it. And it's like they're participating more in their own garden when they see the butterflies or the birds or, or you know, or whatever. Yes. And, you know, one thing, my, my husband is also a horticulturist, and he works at uh, Chanticleer Gardens in Wayne, Pennsylvania. And he is known for a lot of container work with a lot of tropicals and other plants. So, um, you know, we're living proof that natives and non-natives can coexist beautifully. <laughs> there you go. That's perfect. That you have a symbiotic relationship that way. Yeah, absolutely. I would I would guess that probably um, we have about an acre that's really heavily planted. Obviously, because we've got this this disease, the plant disease. It's probably like sixty percent native and maybe forty percent other um, other plants. And you know, oftentimes other plants can also offer. Um, pollen and nectar, you know, so that, you know, we don't have to write them off completely. But um, I know that we have as much wildlife as we do because we have so many natives. Well, and people, you know, using the American Beauties definition, people might be surprised if they had you accompany them through their garden, just how many natives they actually already have. You're exactly right. You really are. And that's why I used Annabelle as an example. Um we just haven't appreciated them enough, and we haven't 
really called out their nativeness. And, and I, I think that's going to be changing. I can see that being something that's included on labels, plant labels moving forward. Oh, absolutely. And, you know, our, our plant labels have four sides. There's a lot of information on there for people so they'll be successful and information, too, about the benefits they have for nature. So they can learn about it. Their kids can learn about it. And, you know, then they're going to share that information with their friends and family. And, and so it goes little by little. You know, we'll get there. That's right. We, we will get there. You know, here in Minnesota, I know you're familiar with the TV stations, but, you know, CARE 11 was offering uh, milkweed seeds to listeners this year to try to, you know, get folks to plant milkweed to help provide habitat for the monarchs. You know, the same could be done at some point in the future with certain, you know, native cultivars. If, if people are trying to bring back or uh, bring into vogue a certain plant, that media could help in that way, couldn't they? Oh, absolutely. I think the media can um, play a key role. I mean, here, look at you. You know, you, you're kind enough to do this show and, and um, help people learn a little bit more about native plants. And, yeah, I think media can play a great role. And I'd also like to see for Minnesota, too, I noticed when I was there, um, you'll notice along the freeways where they've just mowed the strip next to the road, and in the middle are um, a lot of um, native plants and grasses that are, um, provide a lot of habitat. It looks beautiful. Um, and Minnesota does a really good job with that. Hmm. Well, I thought it would be fun to go through some native plant myths. And I got these native plant myths and facts uh, from Vera Strader. She had them on a Master Gardener website. And so uh, why don't we just go through them, and then I'll just have you give us your thoughts. These are all myths, so they're not facts, but maybe help us debunk some of these uh, common perceptions about native plants. The first one is, native plants are nothing but brush. Well, that's ridiculous. Um, <laughs> like, um, just thinking about just in Minnesota, think about oaks and maples and asters and blueberries and pines and Winterberry and phlox and columbine are all native plants. They're not brush and they're not trash. Yeah. Myth two, road ditches contain native plants. You know, very often they don't. Um, uh, ditches are one place where um, invasive species often thrive um, because, um, you know, they're uh, not generally um, maintained very well. So, you know, think about... Um, you know, like buckthorn in Minnesota, mm. purple, purple loop, rice, thistle, creeping charlie, wild parsnips. Those are a lot of things you see in ditches. Um, and out here would be, you know, Bradford pear. But commonly those, you know, those aren't really native plants. Uh, that's a great point. And that is actually, I think, one of the more common myths about natives is that it's just, you know, stuff that you see in the ditches. So you're bringing up a great point here for people. Myth number three, native plants will take over your yard. Uh -huh. I do think that's a really common myth, and that doesn't have as much to do with if it's native or not. It's how the plant distributes its seed. And, um, you know, like I said, we test our plants really thoroughly. We would never um, have a plant in our collections that was invasive, that would, for whatever reason, uh, take over. I mean, that's not a landscape-worthy plant, and so we just wouldn't include that. And I don't think that's – it's a generalization, so it's not really true about natives in general either. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's more of a side characteristic. I like how you started out that response with talking about how it distributes the seed or how it, how it propagates itself. And that's with every plant, right? Because in order to survive, they have to figure out a way to do that. Yeah, the fact that you're screening them is so helpful. Myth number four, native plants need no water. Well, that's crazy, too. All plants need water. And I think what people are, are, are getting at is that after native plants have become established, after they've been in the ground for a year, they very often have deep roots, and they will be able to um, live with the amount of rain in that area. You know, they've been conditioned to do that um, through the centuries. But you know, to, to live with the, you know, current, you know, the average amount of rainfall in, in that area. 
but all need all plants need um, water to get established. And you know, just think of them like babies. You know, it's that first year you really have to take good care of them and make sure they're watered, water really thoroughly instead of often. Um, but they're are no plants that need no water. <laughs> yeah, that's exactly right. Myth number five, native plants bring in bad bugs. You know, that's absolutely not true. I think when people think of bad bugs, it's probably more things that are going on in their vegetable gardens. Um, <laughs> so and let's just remember, no insects means no baby birds. And yeah. yeah, I mean, without insects, you know, our frogs and our little garden snakes and everything, they wouldn't have anything to eat either. And I think bad insects really are found most often in vegetable gardens. Well, we'd be remiss to talk about native plants without discussing how they've adapted to regions over time. Do you want to talk a little bit more about that? I know you had a slide on this in your presentation. Sure. You know, plants have been evolving, you know, over the eons, depending on, you know, when we had an ice age, it pushed plants farther south. And as the ice age receded, plants came further north. And, um, it's interesting to note that plants are still on the move today. We've been seeing, you know, record warming temperatures, which means zones are changing. We've seen the USDA sort of redefine their zones. So plants are always and ever sort of moving and evolving and changing. So we should think about that. One interesting thing is that if a plant has lived uh, in a particular area for so long, it's used to the annual rainfall, it's used to the kind of soil, it's used to winter temperatures, and it's more than likely um, evolved some symbiotic relationships with wildlife around it. And it's for those reasons that native plants do make good landscape plants is because they're already at home. They're already at home. I love that. Well, there are many benefits to native plants, to people and wildlife. Why don't we have you review some of the best aspects of introducing more native plants into the garden? Well, like all the things we just said about, you know, being adapted to annual rainfall, they're also less prone to pests and disease because, again, they've evolved with that over the years and and have proven to be successful at it. If they're more, you know, in sync with the, the soil type, they don't really need fertilizer. We don't really have to do any heavy fertilizing. Organic fertilizer is great, but again, chemical fertilizers uh, can be a real problem in um, runoff water. Another thing that I think is really wonderful is that they provide wildlife with their native and their natural diet. You know, our birds weren't meant to feed the bird seed we put in the feeders, although I do that too. Mm-hmm. Um but, you know, they're, they're there for the berries and the nuts and, you know, the pollen and the nectar and, and everything else. And it's kind of fun to be able to watch the birds interact. You know, I can see from my, here from my office window, and, uh, you know, right now there's finches on the um, Rebecca maxima, the giant coneflower. So it's kind of fun to watch them interact that way. And my fringe tree is bearing fruit, and they're going to be ripe any day. And I'm going to sit here and watch the robins come in and eat it all in about three days. Oh, wow. That's awesome. Yeah. Yeah. The other thing, too, is I love listening to Mike McGrath's podcast. And he says all the time that in the summer, birds actually need water more than they need bird seed. So if you want to support, right. you know, so if you want to support birds during the summer, you know, have a fountain or have, you know, some type of, I always say moving water so you don't, you know, attract mosquitoes. But as long as it's moving water and if it's shallow, especially like I, I have some of these urns, you know, where the water spills over the top. Um, I have finches. I have every possible kind of bird that loves to just sit there and get a drink or take a little bath. It's wonderful. It really is. I think that's a really key point that you're making there about the water. Water brings so much life to your garden. We have three water features here. I've got a dish with a a small water lily in the front, and the birds land on it all the time and take a drink. The little squirrels get up there and take a drink. Um, In the back, I've got a bird bath that has a little solar fountain in it, so the birds love to get in there and take their baths and get a drink. And I've got another dish, like one of those like leaf casts, you know, made out of um, cement. Oh yeah. And because that, yeah, because that's very porous, 
it's safe for insects. They can they can walk down to the edge of the water and get a drink. Insects can't really drink from a bird bath very easily. That works really well. And I don't have mosquito problems with any of those, mostly because between evaporation and um, them being so well used, I have to fill them up every day. Yes, yes. <laughs> they also need water in wintertime. And one thing I'm going to try this year that I read about is um, buying an electric dog dish because that stays warm. Yes. Uh, so I'm going to try that this year to see if I can give my wildlife uh, a little help in the winter too. I love that. Yeah, I have a friend, Linda, that does that every year. She puts out, I think, a couple of dog dishes on her deck, uh, along with bird seed. She gets a lot of birds on her deck yeah. you know, for bird watching in the winter. It's, it's really glorious for her. Now, in the presentation, you said that native plants give us a sense of place. And that slide was so striking to me because people don't always think about that, you know, that we're associating plants and places, the places that they come from. And I love that, uh, for instance, on this slide, you included a lady slipper, of course, Minnesota state flower. But do you have some iconic native plants that stand out in your mind as a lover of gardens from all over the world? You know, in Minnesota, I would really have to say um, the lady slipper and trillium. You know, I remember going out in the woods with my mom and um, trillium was her favorite flower. So those are really meaningful to me. One thing I loved about Holland um, was the heather, because that doesn't had never grown in a place I lived before. And so, ericaceous has a lot of ericaceous plants there, and I can just you know meadows just as far as the eye could see with purple heather. I just always thought was so incredibly beautiful. Oh, also when I lived in Holland, I lived in Friesland, way in the north, and the Frisian flag has the yellow water lily leaves. Okay, <laughs> so that. Was a very iconic plant up there on the flag. So that was kind of cute. Gosh, I remember living out in Oregon and just being amazed at the big, beautiful flowers of the Mahonia and and the wild berries. There's berries everywhere. I could bring a little bowl and pick berries my whole way to school. Wow. <laughs> That's fun. How about where you're at right now? Are there native plants that stand out to you? Yes, yes, yes. I love the azaleas, and I'm mad about southern magnolias, bluebells in the springtime. But maybe the funniest one is holly. Um, Yeah, we have huge holly trees here. And, you know, you don't really have holly in Minnesota for Christmas decorations. That's right. Yeah, so I felt like I was like the queen of the jungle because I had all this (laughs) holly. And I got florist boxes, and I cut tons of it. And sent them back to all my friends in Minnesota so they'd have some for Christmas. That's lovely. Oh, my gosh. Is it beautiful in person when you're standing by a holly tree? Yeah, I just thought I was so rich. I couldn't believe how much holly I had. Gosh. Yeah, that's pretty tremendous. I bet your Minnesota friends were like, hey, hook me up with some holly this year. Exactly. (laughs) Well, you also referenced the importance of basic good rules of horticulture for planting natives, like right plant, right place. And are there any other pieces of advice, especially regarding design aesthetics when it comes to working with native plants? You know, that's a great question. You know, people always have this idea that they must somehow garden differently with native plants, but that's absolutely not true. Native plants, just like any other plants, should follow all the good rules of horticulture. Plants should be um, the right plant in the right place. It should be of a size. You know, you you don't want to put a 10-foot shrub in an area where it's only going to get three feet. You know, Mm -hmm. you have to the right plant. And I think people should remember, too, that um, native plants, plants can be really key in helping people find solutions to problems. For instance, if you have a really wet area, you can look up uh, native plants. You can do it on our website and put in natives that like having wet feet. Mm. They will grow there. Or if you have a spot that's really dry and shady, there are native plants that are also evolved to live in areas like that. So they can help you find solutions to problems. And design can be formal or informal. There's a great landscaping company out here um, that does really high-end, uh, elegant, formal gardens, and they're always native plants. And just everybody should know that, you know, there isn't a garden in the world that doesn't take maintenance. 
you know, everything is going to take some time to get established and needs to be cared for, especially, you know, in its first year and, and thereafter. No such thing as no maintenance. You can't just go throw a can of, you know, wildflower in a jar out someplace and think it's going to be okay. That's exactly right. You know, I, I remember when I interviewed Tara Nolan, the author of Raised Bed Re- Revolution, the tagline in her book says, build it and plant it. And I said, I told her, I said, well, it doesn't say, you know, build it, plant it and forget it, which even in raised beds, you know, people think, oh, I've got a raised bed now. I can just, you know, walk away. It'll just take care of itself. So great point there. So whether it's natives or veggie gardening and raised beds, you've still got to maintain your gardens. And I think the whole hobby of gardening is all about getting out there and spending time in the garden, not planting it and forgetting it. You know, I think you're absolutely right. It's kind of like a lifestyle choice, you know, like people that have dogs go on long walks, which is great. Mm. And I think when people get into gardening and they and they really get their hands dirty and feel it, they find relaxation. You know, it can be like active meditation to be weeding. You're outside and The plants are beautiful and the birds are singing. And I think when people get into gardening, what they find is that it isn't that nasty word, work. It's we playing in the garden. You know, Mm -hmm. we play in the garden. It's a lot funner than watching TV. Yes. I remember the first time I talked to Lori Eubanks, who is a great garden designer. The whole uh, first half of our phone conversation was about the therapeutic and self-care benefits of gardening. I mean, she loves gardening. It's probably the most life-giving thing that she does. So absolutely. Now, you're a wonderful champion of biodiversity, which is sadly in decline. I know that's one of the things that that we've already talked about. But there are contributing factors that you feel are especially detrimental and that people need to be aware of. So if you're going to introduce this you know, topic to someone who maybe is completely unaware or uh, might be opposed to some of these viewpoints, what do you say to people to help them understand um, that there are things that are having a very detrimental effect on our biodiversity? I think the leading cause of, uh, you know, of our problems with biodiversity is simply habitat loss. I mean, you know, there are more and more people. We take up more and more land. Wildlife has less and less. And it's surprising that only between 5 and 15% of the land in the United States is protected. And many of those areas um, have multiple use clauses. There's also fragmentation. So all of these nature, native areas, nature areas aren't connected. And so the wildlife can also, um, it's also not connected. Two million acres, that's about as big as Yellowstone National Park, are given over to development each year. I'm not saying development is wrong. I'm just saying that's that's a lot of land, and, and that's why our backyards are becoming so important. We can create these wildlife way stations for animals, and we need to because so much of it, you know, isn't there anymore. I mean, growing up in Minnesota, I would see milkweed in the ditches and goldenrod and roos, and, you know, you just don't really see that as much anymore. You know, a lot of since Roundup Ready corn and soybeans came along, you know, farmers are trying to make a living and they're planting everything they can. And, you know, that's been a big change. It's been a big change, especially in Minnesota. You know, another thing, too, is that we have a lot of invasive plants that have escaped our gardens. You know, over 100 million acres um, have been invaded by 5,000 species of alien plants in the U.S., Um, I know when I lived in Minnesota, you know, getting rid of buckthorn was a full-time job. You know, out here, Bradford piers are terrible. And so you kind of just think about that. You know, most of our land, 54% of our land is made up of city and suburbs. And so in a typical development, what you'll see is a lot of grass and probably some exotic plants planted up next to the house, and that's it. And, you know, grass... Um, doesn't support any biodiversity. So if we could just think about our own yards and how, you know, the little differences that we make can add up to a huge difference um, 
for our environment and for wildlife and for all of our shakes. Mm, I love that. Yeah, you're right. It, and it's sometimes it's so subtle when the invasives start to take over an area, you don't even recognize what's happening. You know, for instance, in the ditches, you know, that yep. people people just don't appreciate it until you point it out to them. And then it's like the veil gets lifted and they can see what you're talking about. And I think that's one of the big challenges that people who are trying to educate individuals in this field, this is the challenge is to open people's eyes to what's really going on around them. I think everybody understands habitat loss. We can, you know, get our arms around that. But sometimes when we get into, you know, the terms that can be divisive or you get kind of a nebulous term like native plants and people start to tune on a little bit because we're not clear enough about what we're talking about. Right, right. And, you know, another big one that I didn't mention is water runoff. It's the it's number one cause of water pollution. And, you know, this is water that's coming off of our lawns and our driveways. It's picking up heavy metals, pet waste, chemicals from fertilizers and, and other things and, and getting going right into the sewer system. So, you know, another thing people can do, especially if you're on a little bit of a hill, is, you know, like just make sure that that front area of your garden is, is planted so that, you know, that can trap and hold that water. It's not going to run away. And, um, you know, try not to use those chemicals. But um, runoff water is, is actually the leading cause of, of water pollution. And, you know, even in Minnesota with our 10,000 lakes, we've got to really be careful. Mm-hmm. Well, Lauren Lindsay, uh, the blogger from Houston that I met at the Garden Bloggers Fling, had posted an article from the Houston Chronicle back this uh, summer, and it was talking about the tax day flood. They had a terrible flood go through Houston on tax day, April 15th. And as part of that, they were trying to determine how they were going to spend money to address future flooding. And one of the proposals is to plant native plants because, number one, they can withstand flooding better because they're designed for that area, but also they minimize runoff. They play a huge role in handling runoff in these areas. So I was really happy to see that. It's a great article. I'll have to link to it again with the show, but very valid point on the water runoff. So Yeah, absolutely. she's great. I really, yeah, I really like what she's doing. And that is key. And, you know, one thing it's kind of funny, I think sometimes people in harsh climates like Arizona and Texas get the native plant things better because that's all that will grow. <laughs> Great point. <laughs> Yes, I remember the slide, the Minnesota uh, lady slipper, and then it was a big cactus for yeah, a uh, giant saguaro. Saguaro. Yeah, okay. it's a giant saguaro, and you know, yeah, that's very native. And I had to laugh; just it tickled me to death when I first saw one in an American Beauty spot. <laughs> They're awesome. Well, in your talk, you especially took some time to talk about birds and the bees. I thought it was so great because you shared some really powerful and informative facts when you got to this part of your presentation. Well, thank you very much. I mean, again, I think once people, you know, everybody just wants to know why before they do a task. And I, I think if people understand these couple of pretty simple things, it, everything will kind of click and fall into place for them. You know, I think um, one thing that's really important to note is that um, most insects can only eat plants with which they share an evolutionary history. Um, they're called specialists. Entomologists call them specialists. And 90% of plant-eating insects are considered specialists. Wow. So without their plant or their host plant or whatever, you know, then there's nothing. I mean, you know, we all know the story about the monarch and um, and the butterfly weed, and that's really critical. Host plants are critical because, you know, very often that's the only plant the caterpillars can eat and the only plant that the, the adults will, will lay their eggs on. So that's really important to remember. And we did touch on this just a little bit, but um, 96% of songbirds in North America need to feed insects to their young. And, you know, it is just amazing when you think about, you know, you're a busy mom of four, 
But can you imagine having to feed your kids 5,000 times in 14 days? (laughs) Great point. (laughs) You know, so think about all those caterpillars we need. If you want birds, you know, who doesn't love birds in their yard? Then we have to give them the food that they need um, to grow. And, you know, imagine 5,000 caterpillars for just one clutch of a a chickadee. A chickadee doesn't even weigh a half ounce. Just think how much it would be for a cardinal. Yes. So we need host plants. If we don't have those things, we don't have insects, we don't have baby birds, we don't have butterflies, we don't have anything. Mm Mm-hmm. Well, and as you're talking, I, I was thinking about how many of my friends, if I showed them a picture of a bug versus a bag of bird seed, and I said, which of these would you use to feed the birds? I think the majority would pick bird seed. Because I think, oh, with, sure. you know, with all the commercialization, we've lost touch with the fact that, you know, before there was bird seed, this is what birds ate, you know, and birds still do eat, you know, insects. And I think there's a perception issue here when it comes to what birds need, such as, you know, more water during the, the hot heat of the summer and insects. You are so right. And I think it's really key that you brought that up because... We, we have lost this. We're getting farther and farther away from the land, and, and we've lost some of these basic principles like that. I think that's really key what you said. I I volunteered at the, the local tri-state bird rescue, and I brought out, they were having like an open day, and I brought out a bunch of plants that had berries, and nobody got it. Nobody got why I was there. Nobody got that it was bird food. Um, and these are people that you think love birds. Yeah. So I think you really, that's important what you said. Mm -hmm. Well, I have grapes. I grow grapes and I don't do anything with them other than let the birds have at them. And of course, they love them, you know, this time of year. And they're so beautiful. They're up and over the arbors. So, you know, they don't have to work too hard to get them. But, you know, that's primarily why I grow my grapes is just to offer a little appetizer to the birds that are interested and they're I know. beautiful. They are beautiful. I, I, I have to laugh, too, because we must have 15 um, blueberry bushes in our yard, and I never get, I haven't had one blueberry yet in years. <laughs> <laughs> and you know what? It's okay. I'm glad that uh, somebody's uh, having a nice little snack. Yep, somebody's getting it. Hey, when you're growing blueberries, are your blueberries in containers, and then do you add coffee grounds? No, our um, blueberries are in the ground. There are some blueberries now that have been kind of uh, designed for container culture, and they're called brazil berries. But all of ours are in the ground, and we don't use coffee grounds specifically, although we compost everything. Our rule is that nothing green ever leaves the property. We compost everything, we shred the leaves, and and chip everything and and make mulch with that. So it is eventually getting back into the garden, but um, not directly. Our soil um, acid enough for them that they really don't need anything extra. Oh, you lucky duck. Well, as a writer yourself, you call on garden communicators to encourage their readers to take small steps toward building wildlife habitats. There is growing awareness around wildlife habitats, but you've got this project that you've done this summer. What do you call it? Wildlife? We're calling it a wildlife way station. Wildlife way station. That's right. You know, people should know that you don't have to have um, spend a lot of money or do major changes to start um, making your yard more wildlife friendly. One thing you could do is just maybe lose a little bit of lawn every year. <laughs> that really isn't helping anything. You know, you could plant that full of native plants, or you could think about lawn replacements like fern glades and sedges, um, you know, things like that. So think about taking up a little piece of that sod every year. It doesn't have to be a great big project. Um, we talked about water. Water is key. All wildlife needs to have some water to live. So Really, just by adding a dish or a bird bath or anything like that, keep it clean, that is a huge addition to your yard. Again, you know, try to eliminate chemical use. The more you do that, the, the better off you'll be. Don't cut your plants back in the fall. I know a lot of people think it doesn't look very tidy, 
but actually that provides amazing cover for all kinds of wildlife, even um, like gr- grasses are very often hollow and insects will get down inside of those stems and over winter it provides, you know, great habitat for other small mammals and, you know, frogs and toads and everything like that too. So if you can, just leave that standing and, and, and wait for next spring. And of course, you know, we joke and we call it, you know, install more houses. You know, we've got bird houses and mason bee houses and bat houses. And those are, um, could be really fun little family projects to, to make one together in a weekend. But all of those little things really, really help. And, you know, go wild, plant natives. We're calling them uh, wildlife way stations because if everybody had a little way station in their backyard, wildlife, you know, especially think about during a migration, you know, would have a food source along the way. That's really key. And and this year we're really excited. We had a contest with Country Gardens Magazine, and we were giving away a wildlife way station. And this wonderful young couple from New Hampshire won, and we're going to be installing it this week. And I'm so excited. I can't stand it. They're doing the groundwork right now. I'm going to be flying out Thursday. And so what we decided the garden had to contain, it has to have a water feature. Um, it has to have a place, you know, that provides cover for animals. Um, think about evergreens. They provide cover all year. It has to have um, food. It's going to have food. It's all native plants that are going to feed the wildlife all through the year. And animals that need a safe place to raise their young. And it's going to be an organic garden. Stay tuned for more on that. But I couldn't think of a more deserving family. And I'm getting the owners to come up and get their hands dirty and plant and we're going to have a blast. I love it. Now, are you custom making any any type of feeder for the Wildlife Way Station? You know, actually, I had one donated. Hmm. Um, actually, my husband, Dan, donated uh, two chairs for the garden, and his brother has a business called Five Ply Design, and he has these amazing, um, really modern Bentwood birdhouses. So he gave me one of those for the couple and I think um, my father-in-law didn't want to be outdone, so I think I'm bringing up another gourd birdhouse from him. <laughs> oh, wow. That's awesome. That's great. So what's, yeah. what's your brother-in-law's business named again? Five Ply Design. Like P-L-Y? Yep. Danielle had always wanted a house with a yellow door, so they have a beautiful gray house with a yellow door, and my husband did two chairs for them. They call them Wave Hill Chairs uh, in the United States, and we'll paint those yellow to match your front door. Oh, that'll be a sweet addition, won't it? Yeah, and we'll put the little water vase there too, so that'll be close by, and she can watch all the birds and the insects coming in for a drink. I love that. Very charming. Well, any closing thoughts on native plants, Peggy Ann, before we wrap things up? I would just say to people, don't be scared. You know, I think sometimes horticulturists in, in our business, we make it kind of hard for consumers we give plants really complicated Latin names, and we, we take a little of that magic away. And I just want people to, you know, it's just like Nike. It's like, just do it. Mm. You know, you don't have to a million-dollar investment. Go over to the garden center today, buy three plants, and put them in the ground. And little by little, bit by bit, all of the changes you make are going to make such a huge difference for wildlife for our own health and well-being. And, you know, what a great way to um, enrich your own life, you know, to do this. And, you know, like we've been trying to say, it doesn't take a million dollars. It just takes a little bit of time and a lot of love and you got it. Absolutely. Well, and the benefits back to you, I think, come back tenfold. So it's a worthy, worthy investment for sure. Yeah, I think so too. Peggy Ann, why don't we end by having you share your contact information, how people can get a hold of you, and maybe where you're at on social media. Our website is at www.abnativeplants.com. You can always find me there. My email address is Peggy Ann, P-E-G-G-Y-A-N-N-E, at abnativeplants. Oh, that's easy. Dot com. Yes. Oh, that's awesome. And then you have something that you are going to give away to a lucky listener. 
Yeah, I would really like to. There is a marvelous book out called Bringing Nature Home, How You Can Sustain Wildlife with Native Plants. It's just recently been updated. It's written by Douglas Talmy, who is an entomologist here at the University of Delaware, and he really delves into, you know, the connection between plants and insects and sort of how our ecosystem got broke and how we can all help fix it. I love that. Well, Peggy Ann, I can't thank you enough for being on the show today. This was so fun, and I'm so glad we got to connect not only today, but at the Garden Bloggers Fling. That was tremendous. I just so appreciate your time today and talking about native plants. Thank you very much. It was so nice to meet you, too, and I hope I'm going to see you at the one in D.C. next year. I'm planning on going. I Tammy Schmidt, I, I think, will do a fantastic job of planning that. It sounds like she's already got most of it planned, and it sounds so good. So I'm really looking forward to it. And I did listen to the interview that she did about the tour next year, and it sounds like we'll start in the city and then work our way out to the country. We'll do uh, day one in the city in D.C. and then out to the suburbs uh, to see uh, suburban gardens where the majority of people, you know, live when they're done working in the city and then to the countryside. So she's got some uh, country gardens that we'll look at as well. So it sounds really, really nice. Yeah, she's done an amazing job. I'm really looking forward to it. And I just want to thank you so much for giving us this opportunity to talk about native plants. And, you know, it, it's people like you that are really going to make the difference. Well, it's spreading the word. I think spreading the word because I think everybody wants to do better. They just don't always know what they need to be doing outside, what they should be doing. All it is is talking about it. And then I thought, you know, your last piece of advice as far as not being afraid. You know, we do make it so complicated sometimes. Uh, it, was, it reminded me of the the definition that you gave of native native plants. It's like most people would read that, <laughs> eyes glaze over, turn the page. Okay, you know, I have no idea what I should plant now. So I love it when we just get down to basics with people that, you know, things like your map are so beneficial and so helpful because it's practical. It's like, I can get on that map, type in my area, what likes what feet, you know, what's native to this area. Those are all very easy things to look up. Well, and I hope that by building this brand, you know, that's what we've tried to do is just make it easier for people to identify what's native and make it easier for people working at the garden center too, because, you know, you can build a display and, you know, it'll be all in one place. <laughs> you know, that's exactly right. The other thing I was thinking as you were talking about making it easy for people, I mean, your vetting process of determining what's going to make it in and what's not, you know, what's going to behave itself, you know, relatively speaking in the garden, you know, what's going to be a good native is so important. I was talking to another friend this past summer who said, why do people stop gardening? And I think that's one of the reasons they stop is if they have a really bad encounter, uh, they make a mistake in planting something and it either doesn't grow at all or it takes over and it's just way too much for them to deal with. So being responsible as a grower, as someone who's putting plants out into the marketplace, that's, uh, that's just key because that's the difference between someone becoming a gardener and staying a gardener or, you know, starting to garden and then saying, you know what, this is not for me. Yeah, I, I think you're right. And, you know, this business was built on love. I mean, we're a business and we need to make a profit and, and keep our growers happy. But th this was built just to help people and to help our environment. And, you know, I, I'm so grateful. We, I have the greatest job in the world. You know, a lot of our royalty money goes back into projects, you know, all over the country. You know, we give money to the National Wildlife Federation, to the Pollinator Partnership. We build outdoor classrooms. You know, we've done, we get to do so much. I get to give so much back and be involved with that. I think I'm the luckiest girl around. Mm. <laughs> it sounds like it. It sounds like it. Well, and it's great. Like you said, when you love your job, it's not a job. It's just doing what makes you feel good every day. Yeah, you're right. Thank you, Peggy Ann. All right. Thank you so very, very much for having me today. I really appreciate it. Oh, my pleasure. Well, and with any luck, we'll we'll do a show about this wildlife way station couple and the whole install. I'd love to love to focus on that with you. So sounds great. I'll send you some info. All right. That sounds good. All right. Bye bye. Bye bye.
Well, that's it for the show today. I want to thank Peggy Ann Montgomery of American Beauty Native Plants for being my guest. I hope that she inspired you with wildlife way stations and native plants, that you'll be incorporating those elements into your garden for 2017. I want to thank my team at Podfly Productions, David Myers, Ein Kadena, and David Gregerson. And just a reminder that I'll have all of the generous information that Peggy Ann shared on the show today in the show notes for today's episode. You can find Find it at my website, sixfootmama.com. That's the number six, F T M A M A.com. And Six Foot Mama is the home for the Still Growing podcast as well. So all of the show notes from every single episode are there at the website. And of course, if you really like the show, one more time, I'd like to invite you to join our Facebook group. It's our listener community for the show. Just head on over to Facebook and type in the words Still Growing Podcast Group and then request to join. You can interact with great guests of the show like Peggy Ann Montgomery, as well as other great guests of the show as well, including All the President's Gardens, Marta McDowell, Vegetable Literacies, Deborah Madison, Joel Karsten of Strawbale Gardens, and Anna Thomas, the author of Vegan Vegetarian Omnivore, just to name a few. And here's the secret. It's also where I post all of the awesome giveaways for my guests and sponsors. So if you're interested in winning a giveaway, like the great book by Doug Tallamy offered by Peggy Ann this week, you've got to get in the group. So I hope to see you there. Go ahead, check it out. I'd love to meet you in the still growing podcast group on Facebook. Well, I'm off to take down more Christmas decorations here. I hope I get it done by next week. Until then, have a great week, everyone. Still Growing with Jennifer Ebling is a SixFootMama.com production made in lovely Maple Grove, Minnesota. Still Growing is a weekly gardening podcast dedicated to helping you and your garden grow.